We're going to get started with week two of the series, and I want to introduce Amy Lynn Heckman from Aurora. She'll be the facilitator tonight. Thank you, Pete. My name is Amy Lynn Hackman. I am a registered nurse and I work for Advocate Aurora Healthcare. I'm gonna be facilitating this evening and just kind of keeping watch of time and introducing our speakers for you. We wanna thank um, Freighted Healthcare, the Washington Ozaki Public Health Department, Advocate Aurora Healthcare, Elevate, and Moraine Park for helping to organize this series for you. Um, so we're really glad you're here, especially with the weather that we've got tonight, um, and we'll get started. I'm gonna invite Ashley down from the Public Health Department. She has a little pre-survey for us. If you were here last week, you'll remember that, and then we have one at the end, so she'll lead us through that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, as Amy said, I am from the health department. Um, and so we just have just a short little three question quiz for you. If you have a cell phone, if you would just take it out and you can scan the barcode um, with your camera, it should take you right to a Microsoft Forms. Uh, if you just wanna answer those three questions, they'll be the same three questions at the end. Uh, we just like to see if uh, any answers have changed through this series and see what you guys kind of learn. Um, so yes, if you scan it, it'll just answer those three questions and then we'll get started with the night. Okay, perfect. It looks like most people have finished. Um, so again, we'll take another one uh, once the presentations are done. So if you wouldn't mind just staying in your seats with the last presentation, Amy will kind of wrap it up and then another barcode will come on the screen. Um, but I'm going to hand it back over to Amy. Thank you, Ashley. We are going to start the evening with Jessica Geschke. Um, on the original flyer, she was our last speaker, but she's gonna be starting out for us this evening. She's gonna talk a little bit about um, her brother's journey and life with addiction and recovery. So we'll invite her down to get started and she can introduce herself and where she's gone from there a little bit more. And we really appreciate you coming to speak. You think this should be happening? Is that on? Yes. Hello? Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you to Mary for inviting me to come and join you guys tonight. Um, my name is Jessica Geschke and I am the pro Outreach Program Manager for ServeURX and the president of Stop Heroin Now, um, which we are now Start Healing Now. Um, Start Healing Now, or SHN, was founded after Linda Lentz lost her son Tony to an accidental heroin overdose. You may better know us um, as Stop Heroin Now because we've been in this community for the last nine years. Most recently, our board of directors have embarked on a new direction with SHN. This has included the renaming of our 501c3 nonprofit, branding of our Facebook page, new website, and the name change to Start Healing Now. Our nonprofit organization provides a solid base of continuous care, including resources and financial assistance for safe and sober, um, sober living, education, transitional aftercare programs, and free access to the life saving drug Narcan. But don't worry, we are the same amazing all volunteer based organization that has been dedicated to preventing um, har prevention and harm reduction for the last nine years. SHN stands alongside other loved ones here today, honoring your losses and always remembering those who have gone before us. We are also here with those who have loved ones currently using or if you yourself are in active addiction. There is no judgment here. This is a judgment-free zone, no shame and no stigma. If you are here and in recovery, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge your journey. Congratulations on whatever that path may look like for you on your road to sobriety. I'm very honored to be here today. I myself am a person in long-term recovery. I celebrated 18 years this past May. I am a sister of someone who has struggled with a substance use disorder for 25 years, and I'm going to share a little bit about that journey today. Also joining me today is our SHN Vice President, Michael Beyer. Michael is an outreach representative for Rogers Behavioral Health, and he is an amazing person in that what he does for his job, helping to get individuals into treatment, access to care, 
And I have to leave immediately following this presentation, but he will be here to answer any questions regarding SHN, our OAK program, as well as treatment questions, or to offer support to those seeking residential care, IOP, et cetera. Michael, if you can take a minute, please, and stand up so people can find you afterwards. Make him real embarrassed there. Thank you. So at 13, my brother, that's the Korean guy in the photos, yep, I know, he doesn't look like me. Um, he was adopted at age three from Seoul, Korea. He began using drugs. After two years of continued use, he had his first overdose at the age of 15. I remember that day as if it were yesterday. I got a call from my parents stating that my brother had been taken by ambulance to our local hospital. I met them there and for the first time in my life, I experienced the immense feelings of failure. Walking into his ER room, seeing him hooked up to a number of different machines, one in his nose, IVs in his hands and his arms, a tube down his throat, and my parents. My parents holding each other tight in the corner with tears in their eyes and asking God to please save their son. It was in that moment that I realized I had failed him as a big sister. I was always thought to be his protector, someone who could guide him on his journey into his teen years, and somehow, somewhere along that road, he had gotten lost. This event fueled confusion and sadness and hurt and despair within our family surrounding his addiction. My parents were lost and confused, and after searching for help in what seemed like a hundred places, they came across a program in Jamaica that offered answers to his behavior, behavior, his use, his anger, and his trauma, and they transferred him there. For me, it was bittersweet. He was here one day in all his turmoil and gone the next, leaving this empty hole in my heart. I was a new college student, fresh in the world, trying to make sense of my own life, and it was at that time that I made a decision to change majors and become an AODA counselor. I had these wild dreams of saving the world from addiction one teenager at a time, of being a sounding board for other sisters and brothers, moms and dads, like my brother's counselor, Miss Maisie, had been for our family. You see, Miss Maisie, in all her glory, with our families, was our family's lifeline. While my brother was in treatment, she was the one we spoke with weekly for updates. Each week on Sunday night at 6 p.m., we would gather around our phone and just wait for her to call, waiting to see how he was doing. Most often, we held our breath, waiting for her to tell us if he was okay. Some weeks were better than others, but regardless of what was happening in my brother's treatment, Miss Maisie allowed us to heal while he worked on himself. Because of my experience with her, I wanted other families to be able to heal and grow and to find systems that would wrap around them instead of not knowing what to do next or where to turn, such as my family had endured before we met Miss Maisie. This energy to do more and be more, be better continued as the years followed. My career continued to build and I fought for better tomorrows for me, for my family, but most importantly, for my brother. My brother returned home from treatment, but as many of you know, his addiction followed. He enrolled back into high school, and before graduating, he was known as the largest marijuana dealer in our county. My parents attempted to get him help in many different ways, but as we all know, parents' support, resources, and education can be very hard to find. My brother, of course, was given the dare and just say no speeches at school. We all know how that works. I am a product of those programs growing up in the 80s and 90s, and I did not find long-term recovery until 2004. My brother quickly turned from marijuana to alcohol to cocaine to crack and eventually heroin. My brother's use continued for over another 20, or 20 years. In 2018, he became homeless. I made the choice to allow him to move in with me and my children. In August of that same year, he overdosed on my living room floor. My son was 12 at the time and he found him. He was blue and unresponsive. My son watched as I injected Narcan into my brother's lifeless body and I cried, wake up, wake up, as he screamed in the corner. My brother did come too. And when you think about moments in your life that you wish you could undo, moments that you wish you could take away and protect others from, 
It was that moment. I wish I could take that moment of trauma away from my 12-year-old son. That was the day that came full circle for me. And from that day forward, I made a decision, a decision to become an advocate and help those who are still struggling with this disease gain access to Narcan. I do this through my work with ServeURx. The night of my brother's overdose, he was taken to our local hospital, the same hospital I sat in so many years prior. And as I sat in that waiting room, a mother came in and she was given a prescription for an antibiotic for her child. And she got it out of a vending machine in the waiting room. And I thought, how genius is this? Why are we not doing this with Narcan? So I went to work. I contacted the only pharmacy I knew, which was ServeURx, who is now my employer. And they funded a pilot year to get oak boxes out and into the community. We started with 25 the first year, and that has now grown to 120 boxes statewide and an additional 170 nationwide. Here in these pictures, I'm standing with one of our very first installs at the Horicon Police Department with two of my good friends, Wes Van Epps and Monte Ball, who worked with me in that pilot year. Obviously, that was the year of COVID. You guys can see our masks. Um, the other picture is of me and the Hartford Police Chief, Chief McFarland, when we went there to install the first over, or overdose aid kit in the Hartford Police Department. We install in high-risk areas, and our main focus coming into year three is schools. When people ask me why I created this initiative, a product for Narcan in a box, I created the Oak Box in order to provide Narcan and harm reduction measures to students, their families, and to our communities. So kids like my son don't have to walk into a living room and find their uncle dead and watch their mom revive one of their biggest heroes in their life. It's a trauma that I can't take back. My son's now 17. He talks openly about drugs in his school and community. He knows his classmates are using. He knows that they are at high risk for overdose. However, there's no oak box or a box similar, similar to it, no Narcan on his school campus. So he carries it in his backpack until his school, the place he's supposed to feel safe, installs an oak box and has life-saving measures available. Oak boxes installed during our pilot year were accessed 150 times, with Narcan being removed over 92 times. ServeURx saw a need for the program to continue after the pilot year, and we had a desire to expand its opioid risk management assistant plan beyond benefit design to provide employers with a more in-depth education, training, and resources to support recovery-friendly workplace, safety, and save lives. Due to this, the Oak program was created. ServeURx kicked off its 2022 Oak program in January, and we offer not only free Oak boxes to our clients, but naloxone training, training on the effects of the opioid epidemic, recovery-friendly workplace training, and we install a kit in our, um, with our employers and their clients. Um, here I am in this picture with one of our ServeURx clients, Tom. So what's an oak box? Overdose aid kits or oak boxes are boxes that include the life-saving drug Narcan, information on how to administer the drug in an emergency, other information and resources for those impacted by the um, opioid epidemic, breathing masks, disposer X packets, fentanyl testing strips, informational cards for, um, from our partners at Partnership to End Addiction for Parents. Um, I do have an example of an oak box out there on the table. You can look at that when we're done. And they are hung in high-risk areas such as gas stations, homeless shelters, hotels, recovery community organizations, high schools and colleges, banks, pretty much anywhere you see an AED machine, we want an oak box installed next to it. Um, a little bit about our community commitment. We participated in Mobilize Recovery 2022, kicking off on November 4th in Las Vegas. The Mobilize Recovery bus tour toured 10,403 miles, passing over 25 states plus the District of Columbia, and hosted over 35 recovery um, events throughout the month. By the end of that tour, the bus we rode in was covered with thousands of messages and names that represented an extraordinary amount of hope. But that bus tour wasn't just about hope. Um, it was about action. We distributed over 11,000 fentanyl testing strips, 10,000 free overdose response kits with naloxone, registered new voters, hosted organizing trainings, public narrative trainings, and we hung 200 overdose aid kits onto the walls of recovery community centers, libraries, community 
buildings, city halls, hotels, gas stations, schools, and more. We also found new ways for the recovery community to engage. We got to meet some pretty amazing people along the way, like President Bill Clinton, um, Atlanta's Mayor Andre Dickens, uh, Kentucky's Governor Andrew, or Andy Burchard. We met with National Recovery Advocate and NBA star Chris Heron, um, Danny Trejo, the SAMHSA Regional Administrator, Captain Emily Williams, Matt Damon. We collected these photos and videos. We went live on Facebook. We streamed on iHeartRadio to show the world that recovery is possible and that people are listening. In just under one month, our message was reached reached over 1, million, um, over 1 million Americans through Facebook and iHeartRadio. If you're interested in purchasing an oak for your community, you can do so by the information on this slide. I have that information out there too. Um, ServiorX also continues to provide community outreach to high-risk communities in Wisconsin. They choose to do this with Start Healing Now, our nonprofit. Um, we, ServiorX partnered with SHN, and we are returning to where it all started by placing boxes back into the communities of need. Um, we did that starting in November of 2022. To date, SHN has donated over 35 oak boxes to businesses and community members free of charge. As I stated, SHN is a nonprofit and we exist purely on donations. So I always have to plug that. If you find it in your heart to make a donation, um, we would greatly appreciate it. All donations go to fund overdose aid kits to be placed in your communities. SHN also um, has chosen to partner with Love Logan Foundation. I know that the amazing Aaron and Rick were here last week to speak with you. Together, we are working to create harm reduction efforts during the 2022, 2023, and 2024 school years by installing oak kits throughout the schools in which the youth professional development training um, is offered. We will be providing Narcan training and plant oak boxes with high schools and youth serving organizations to support those harm reduction efforts. And finally, this picture was taken New Year's Day of this year. That's my brother and me and my two kids. He celebrated four years of sobriety this past August. There are so many days where I didn't think he'd live past his 25th birthday. I have dedicated my life to providing Narcan to those who are still among us in the living. I became an advocate for that 12-year-old boy who found himself broken because his hero had fallen short of his expectations because of an unmanageable disease and to remind him that we do recover. For those mothers and fathers out there who have lost their way trying to find access to help for the loved ones for their loved ones in a broken system. Please know, we do recover. For countless members of our community who are actively fighting a substance use disorder with little to no resources at your fingertips, please know, we can recover. Please know also that you're worthy of love and compassion, forgiveness, and most of all, a life of recovery. And for my brother, I'm so very proud of you. Look at you, recover. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. What an amazing, inspiring story. So we wanted to make sure that each week we had a little message of hope to go along with this very tough um, topic of fentanyl and overdose. Um, and that is tonight's focus point is overdose and overdose management and Narcan. Um, so wonderful organization, amazing story, and we really appreciate you speaking so much tonight. Um, I will open it up for a few questions, but I do want you to know also that we have um, some education coming on Narcan from our EMS team next. So if it's, um, not to cut you off ahead of time, but if it's very specific to Narcan and how it functions, I'm gonna ask you to hold those questions and we're gonna let our gentleman speak next. So um, any questions for Jessica, I will bring the microphone and I will request you to speak right into it because we're being recorded and then we can hear your questions. Awesome job, I did great, okay, thank you. You did, <laughs> yes. So one more round of applause for Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. Out, pull out the yes. Do you want to point out one more time again, since Jessica has to go, mm -hmm. any questions about the oak boxes at the end? Um, have your partner. The, the dude standing up back yes. there. Michael Byer, 
Um, yep, he can answer questions about that. We do have resources to, yes. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay. Why are these not in schools? What's the reason? Uh, that's a loaded question, my dear. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, um, um, okay, so they are in some schools in Wisconsin. Uh, we are in McFarland. Um, they are an amazing school who let us come in and put five boxes in there. Um, a mom actually who lost her son Travis um, donated to SHN. We purchased the boxes and went in. We have stickers that we put on the box. It was all in memory of Travis because he went there. Um, we also have one just down the road in Jackson at the Lutheran High School. Um, it's a it kettle, yes, so it's right there. Another amazing school. Superintendent was super open to us coming in and doing that. Um, but it, it depends on the school. Um, so I think you don't it's have stigma. To answer that. Yeah, okay. So it is stigma. just like when I had to give HPV shots, oh, my child might have sex. <laughs> and now we can't put Narcan in the schools because we might encourage using drugs. I think it's because <laughs> if you put Narcan in a school, you would acknowledge that students are using drugs. But they are using. <laughs> they are most certainly using drugs. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, you don't, you don't have to say anymore. I, I get it. Yeah. Yep. All right, thank you. So if anyone has an in to a school, please connect with me because so we do have um, boxes, if you were here last week, I don't know if Aaron touched on that, but um, we are in every UW school except for two. Um, Aaron has done that um, project with another organization who also has boxes, and so fantastic, right? They're in, except I think there's like two that they're working on getting in yet here in Wisconsin. So that question was on colleges, if they're in mm -hmm. colleges. We are not in Marine Park though. I'm not sure who runs this here, but we'd love to be here. Hint, hint. hint. <laughs> All right, thank you very thank much, you guys. Jessica. Try safe. Then I'm going to invite up Kenny and Bob from West Bend Fire and Rescue EMS. And I'll let you guys introduce, introduce yourselves a little more. We, uh, yep. Well, the uh, of the apple sure. Are they going? Her, your slide should be oh, right away. Okay. Do you guys want the handheld mic? Uh, he can have that and I'll have this one. All right. Yeah, on either side. All right, good evening. Uh, thanks for having us. So, uh, Captain Kenny Aslan of the West Bend Fire Department. I run the Fire Prevention Bureau for the West Bend Fire Department. Uh, Captain Bob Monday with the West Bend Fire Department. I'm uh, uh, in charge of uh, training and EMS. So we've been with the department for over 25 years. Uh, both of us spent a number of years on shift. We ran a number of calls. I think towards the end, before we came off of shift, we were each running about 500 calls a year. Uh, now that is significantly reduced since we've had our, our Monday through Friday. Uh, but what we're going to actually talk about is uh, like, let's say the mechanism of action of the uh, opioids. So even though this is more of a fentanyl uh, presentation, one of the things is we're not gonna know what opioid was actually being used if we get called. So um, we just kind of did an over, uh, over encompassing opioid presentation. All right, so the first thing, I just heard this stat yesterday and I didn't realize that this was as prevalent as it was for death. So um, opioid overdoses is the number one cause of death for adults ages 18 to 45. So I didn't believe it at first. I didn't, I was, I was looking for it and I, went, I always go to the WISCARS data. So I'm a huge data person. Community risk reduction requires a great deal of data um, just to show that there is a problem and then how to solve the problem. So um, when I went to this one and I ran it, so if you go to the CDC Whiskars site, what you can do is actually break it down 
by age group. Um, sometimes if you do the first choice, it'll give you uh, ages like uh, zero to 19 and then uh, five year age groups, or you can make the choice. So I made the choice of 18 to 45. So in 2020, there was about 78,000 deaths. 65% of them are almost 51,000 uh, were from poisoning. Now, when you go to this site and you get this box, then you can click on any of the lines up there. So you click on the 65,000 and then it'll break it down. And there's actually three or four different categories of the poisoning. So almost all of them had to deal with drugs. So of that 65%, like 85% of that 65% was all due to drug overdoses, most of them dealing with opioids. So how does it work? Do you want to take this one? Or? Okay, so, um, so when we talk about how this all works, um, so all opioids, whether it's fentanyl, heroin, morphine, so uh, we are able to give fentanyl as a pain reduction. And what happens is uh, the, uh, the opi opioid itself goes through the bloodstream and then it's able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So what you're actually seeing up here is uh, this is a blood vessel, this is the brain, this is the blood-brain barrier. So what happens is uh, the red blood cells drop off the oxygen and able to cross that way and then uh, the fentanyl or whatever opioid is able to cross the blood-brain blood -brain barrier as well. So what happens is it binds, uh, and there's actually multiple opioid receptors in the body, so in the brain, in the GI tract, and in the spinal cord. Okay, so what happens is it's, it becomes very addictive because uh, you end up, it, it goes through the blood-brain barrier immediately. Like as soon as it's there, it's in the brain. And then you get this feeling of euphoria, um, and then the brain feels like it needs the drug. So I think in the next slide it'll talk about how you need ever increasing amounts of the drug. So what happens is you get a tolerance. So these opioid receptors and your brain gets used to it. Now you end up needing more. Either the same amount isn't going to give you the same feeling or you need more to get the same feeling you had before. So uh, these are the three receptors, so that's the mu and kappa and delta receptors, and they become less sensitive to the drug. Okay, so then this is where we come in. So when we talk about the uh, respiratory depression, so um, when you take the drug and it can override the respiratory system. So we have a need to breathe. We, have, we need oxygen coming in, carbon dioxide going out. Well, what happens is, and when we get called, is when somebody either takes too much um, or it was they, more than what they intended. Uh, one of the things I tell people is that drug dealers don't have really good quality control. So you end up with an unknown amount of whatever they don't, they don't know, they're not measuring, and you don't know what you're taking, and that's why I tell people not to take it, um, but they do, and they don't know what they're taking. So then what happens is they lose that respiratory drive, and then there's need for either starting out with respiratory assistance. So one of the things is somebody can do mouth-to-mouth -mouth respirations, somebody can do mouth-to-mask or have a bag valve mask. And then what happens is once the oxygen has stopped flowing throughout the body, it can result in cardiac arrest. So then there's the need for CPR. So uh, if, if someone's doing chest compressions, you are pumping blood throughout the body, and in CPR, uh, the chest um, being compressed and relaxing actually causes the air to go in and out and will uh, allow for that oxygen to circulate. Now the thing is, CPR is only 30% effective. So uh, we are only keeping the brain and the heart alive. We can end up with other problems if we don't have a return of spontaneous circulation within a very short period of time. All right, so then we go into the Narcan. So this is, uh, oh wait, I think I forgot. Oh yeah, so, the, so you can see the opioid receptor right there. Now what happens is the opioids love to stick to these receptors. And then, so when we come in and give Narcan, so this is what Amy was pointing out, what we were gonna talk about. Um, what the Narcan is, it's actually a competitive antagonist. So these 
uh, the opioids that are in the opioid receptors, the Narcan's gonna fight to get those receptors and actually in some cases knock the opioids off the receptors. So uh, when we use Narcan, and it, oftentimes the police officers are there before we are, and they are going to give intranasal Narcan, that's gonna circulate throughout the body and then it's gonna knock some of those opioids off the receptor sites and then it's gonna, the stimulus to breathe starts to come back again. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, Narcan's been around for a while. And like I said, the cops are gonna give it intranasally. We can give it intramuscularly. And one of the things we wanna do is start an IV because that's the fastest route. Now, the thing is, Narcan will work fairly quickly, but it's also going to wear off fairly quickly. So depending on how long a transport we have to the hospital, we may have to do repeated doses just because it does not last that long. So then what do we see? So when Bob and I go to an ambulance call, or as the Colesville people who are sitting here, if they end up as a, on a first response, uh, one of the things we see, I talked about how they lose their respiratory drive. So someone that is overdosed has lost their respiratory drive. Uh, one of the telltale signs is constricted pupils. So as soon as we get somewhere, if we're looking at the pupils of an unresponsive patient or an unresponsive patient that's not breathing, the majority of the time, if they have constricted pupils, we are suspect of an opi uh, opiate overdose. So um, in that instance, we are more than likely going to move to the Narcan. And I, I guess you can't overemphasize that. They are really pinpoint those pupils. Yeah. I mean, they, they're clamped down pretty far, and you're shining a bright light into them, and they're not moving. Usually, uh, they are just there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a very telltale sign, along with some of the other ones that Ken's going to go into mm -hmm. quickly. So then, uh, change of skin color, obviously. Yeah. So if they are not breathing, they're either going to be pale or they're going to be blue. Uh, respiratory rate's going to be slow, heart rate's going to slow down, uh, and then they're also going to experience a low blood pressure. All right, so here is the number of times we have used Narcan. So, the West, so we ran the statistics today just to make sure we had everything right. Um, there is no real trend over the last five years. So uh, what, what you can see here, the first column is how many times West Bend Fire Department paramedics gave Narcan on calls in the West Bend Fire Department response area. So these are, um, or it could also be mutual aid calls as well, but most of these, uh, almost all of them I can guarantee are West Bend calls, because I went through the numbers. Uh, there may have been one or two that might have slipped past that may have been mutual aid, but every one of those should almost all be in the city of West Bend or our coverage area in the town of West Bend and town of Barton. Second column, for the intercepts, so we do paramedic intercepts with the surrounding departments. So um, if there was a chance that there was an opioid overdose, somebody was doing CPR, and we ended up responding. So we respond to paramedics in a car. We transport with the surrounding department, and um, so we would have given Narcan in that time. So our totals for the previous five years are all pretty consistent. There's no up or down trend as far as these numbers, but there isn't, it isn't going down either. So we're seeing right now, we're just seeing a flat line basically. However, as the city grows and as our numbers grow for the areas we cover in the surrounding areas, uh, we could probably expect that those numbers will climb in the next three to five years, depending on what happens. And, you know, we keep talking about or hearing about a, an impending recession. And, of course, during a recession, things like this continue to go up. So we may see an increase if we see an economic downturn in the next 18 to 24 months. So one thing these numbers do not show is how many times law enforcement administered prior to our arrival where we did not have to administer mm -hmm. because the uh, patient already has come to enough for us and started breathing on their own. So in addition to that, how many times the public has administered Narcan and never even called us, you know, inside the city. So uh, the public themselves have already reversed it. So this is just the number of times we have administered Narcan. And some of these calls, uh, we have, have some of these patients may have required more than one dose of uh, Narcan too, but these are actual people uh, right here, so. 
All right, so before we take questions, um, we wanted to kind of talk about some of the stories because uh, directly related, and not only the story of the incident, but the background from it. So we had, this was back in 2011, and the call, it was in Station 2's area on River Road, right outside one of the apartments on River, and the call initially started, there was a anesthesiologist from the Mayo Clinic. So she grew up here, um, she was back visiting, and just happened to be driving by someone down in the street. So they stopped, she had a pocket mask with her. Do we have, how much time we got? Okay, good, yeah, so um, had a pocket mask with her. She starts doing mouth to mask breathing. Husband calls 911, we show up, She's unresponsive, but she was laying in the street. So we did take C-spine precautions just because we didn't know if there was trauma involved. But as we're doing this, there was a sheriff's deputy that was tailing her, undercover deputy, who then said, yeah, it could be a narcotics overdose. She's a known narcotics user. Um, so we uh, packaged her up. The uh, anesthesiologist was still doing. Uh, we gave her a valve, bag valve mask, and so she was breathing for her. Uh, and then we got her into the ambulance, started the IV, gave her just the tiniest bit of Narcan. She was only like five foot two, maybe a hundred pounds. Uh, 0 0.4 milligrams of Narcan was enough to bring her back right away. So we transported her to the hospital without incident. She was crying the whole way. Really didn't give us a lot of information. So. Later that night, I'm gonna relate this to the mental health issues that why people do this, uh, why people take the, the, the opioids. So later that night, totally unrelated call, totally separate area of town, uh, get a call for an MS patient stuck on the toilet. Uh, the neighbor is able to get the garage door open, but is unable to get the service door open from the garage to the house. So I call station one, I said, hey, we may need the door spreader. Um, I'm, I'll let you know when we get there. So we get there, call for the door spreader, waiting for truck one to show up. So the, na the neighbor that was, that was the one that made the call said, um, are you the one that helped my daughter earlier? And I was like, ah. Uh, well, I can't confirm or deny because of HIPAA laws. Said there was a call on River Road with a girl. Said, but I can't really tell you anything about it, but you can tell me about her. So he goes, yeah. He goes, she was a straight A student. And then when she got to be about 16, her mother and I got divorced. And she fell into a bad crowd, uh, got pregnant at age 17, and her life has just been a mess ever since. So. Uh, a lot of people that may be uh, unwilling or unable to help some of these opioid users or abusers uh, don't understand, like let's say the, uh, how do I put it, the ability to cope. So uh, I was getting the feeling while talking to the dad that this girl, you know, she had a great life. Now she hit her first major bump in the road and wasn't able to handle it, completely fell apart. Uh, whether or not she fell apart and then the drugs made it worse or if she just really couldn't handle how badly her world was falling apart. But this was a person who, under normal circumstances, had her parents not gotten divorced, had any number of things not happen, she probably would have graduated high school with, a, with either you know close to a 4.0, probably would have went to college and done really well, but because of her inability to cope with the um, stressors of this terrible thing in her life, she fell into opiates. So um, we don't get involved that often. This was a rarity that we would end up hearing the background of the family, but uh, it um, really gave me the, um, uh, the willingness more to help these people just because they, they the people that fall into this trap of, of being involved in opiates, don't, they don't really know what they're getting into. Um, and they're looking, because when we were transporting her, I said, why did you take this? And her answer to me was, I just like getting high. But clearly there was more to it. So uh, I'm hoping that you know, stuff like this when coming here to speak to you guys is enough and, and getting people out there to kind of help solve the problem. 
we, we could say, and I, I know Kenny can relate to this too, that it involves all social economic classes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not, you know, the kids with the bad crowd. It's the kids with the good crowds, mm -hmm. you know. I've, I, I know a story of a, a girl that was a star athlete in high school, was injured, was uh, prescribed uh, oxycodone, uh, became addicted to it, and uh, uh, she didn't turn out too well uh, later on in life. But, uh, and Kenny and I both have had personal family mm -hmm. members that have uh, passed away from uh, uh, opiates, uh, poisoning, and all that. So it it it, it, mm -hmm. it hits everybody, you know. Yeah. So uh, I, I was just going to relate some of the things that you would see on a scene if you if that things like that would happen. Um, but uh, one of the biggest things that we always talk about when we arrive on scene is scene safety. So if you see something like that, just take take one second to look around so you don't kneel down in the needle or you don't uh, like uh, get poked with anything or anything sharps like that. Just to make sure that you're safe yourself. Uh, there, and there are reported cases of rescuers actually becoming stuck with needles and stuff like that. So you don't want that to happen to you. I think that's going to come along with the Narcan training that you guys are, uh, Narcan training is coming or, There's, yeah, um, planned. I'm just looking for the other microphone. Okay. 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 Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, there we go. Um, the health department does have some information out back and they'll be here when we're done with the talk as well and they've got a little more information on some Perfect. of the kits so, and the trainings. So. And if you guys want training, uh, you know, we do offer Narcan training to, uh, to groups. So uh, if you, you can call the fire department and we can come out and uh, teach you. So that's all I have. Questions? I have a oh, quick, a oh boy, <laughs> I have a really quick as well too. Yeah. Do you want to mention, so if somebody has a kit or if there's, you know, community kits out there, anything about like Good Samaritan or those kinds of issues with helping someone? So if yeah, you would Good find? Samaritan laws, Good Samaritan laws protect you from uh, uh, liability, from being sued for helping a person when you have good intentions. So don't be afraid to get in there and get involved. You are not going to get sued. You are not going to be arrested. You're not going to be taken to court. Good Samaritan laws protect the lay rescuer. What I mean by that is somebody that's not really involved in medical. Myself, uh, because of my job description, I actually have a duty to act, so Good Samaritan does not protect uh, me, but it does protect the lay rescuer. So, all of you guys. Thank you. Okay, well, questions. Again, I'll come around, um, speak into the microphone, and I'm going to start in the front and work my way back. So we know Narcan works with heroin and such, and I've seen fentanyl when I worked in a hospital and their chest stopped moving. So how do you know it's not a fentanyl overdose and how long does it take for that to wear off and how many doses of Narcan do you have to give? Well, so you, <laughs> you just don't know what they're taking. In the hospital, you give it via IV, right? right. So that the, when it's administered in the vein intravenously, it's a lot more potent. It has a lot more staying power okay. than when it's administered through the nose. I mean, the quantity uh, with the nasal Narcan is four milliliters. But it that, doesn't work on fentanyl. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Narcan works on fentanyl over Yeah, it's an yes. opioid. Yeah, it's uh, an let opioid. Let me see if I can get back to that. Okay. I don't okay, know so if I had that one in there. No, uh, I didn't. Fentanyl, heroin, oxy, okay. uh, and then I can go through a bunch of street names too if you yes. want to call it, but yeah, we don't need that. No. So. Okay. And when you show up on a delivery <laughs> and you think the mom was doing drugs, do you, don't give Narcan to the baby. Yeah, you know and, I, and just so you know, opioids do cross the blood brain or the blood, the placenta barrier. But yeah. you put them in withdrawal right away, and then yes. I got to deal with mm -hmm. them. Exactly, <laughs> but they're alive. But they're alive. Well, and that's the other thing too. Like, let's say when we show up somewhere, um, if someone is unresponsive or in respiratory depression, we only want to give enough. Uh, to bring them out of the respiratory depression, uh, just because we've had, that was the cancer patient, right? Well, it was yeah, a, or are you talking about the uh, Appleton incident? No, ours, I think we had oh. one. <clears throat> there was a, an incident, and I, I, wa I want to say this goes back 15 years, uh, cancer patient, and uh, they were unresponsive. Well, then they gave, I don't remember who the crew was, but they, they gave Narcan, and I, they titrated it, but they... I don't want to say they overdosed on the Narcan. I want to say they gave enough that took away the not only the respiratory depression, but also woke the patient up. Well, now all those opioid receptors, the, it'll, it, it, it alleviated the analgesic effect, 
this cancer, this terminal cancer, pa cancer patient was now in excruciating pain. So that's where we, we have to have that Goldilocks area between just enough and, and not too much. Because the other thing too is, uh, so Dr. Jesslin hates it uh, when they give too much. So she tells the story of, she was working at- uh, She's our medical director. Yeah, she was working at Menominee Falls Hospital and the Milwaukee Fire Department paramedics gave some and then they gave more just before they arrived. Well then after they dumped the patient onto the bed, then the patient wakes up, starts swinging. So uh, you know now you've got a patient that's angry and looking to swing and, and start hurting people because their their high was taken away. So when you give the Narcan, again, you're, we're titrating it and just giving enough to, to keep them. We wanna keep them under, but we don't want them to stop breathing. And, and that's why, again, we gotta keep giving it. So like, let's say <clears throat> A, an amount of heroin that they took or the amount of fentanyl that they took and then depending on the concentration will determine, again, we're not gonna know so we, we have to play uh, a little bit of experimentation and give a little bit, give a little bit more, watch for it wears off, see if we need to bag the patient. Uh, by bag them, I mean use the bag valve mask to, ke to keep them breathing or breathe for them. So it, it, is a, it is a very delicate balance that we're playing with the Narcan when we're giving it. Yeah, we, we base it not on level of consciousness like you would with your nasal administration. Mm -hmm. We base it on the respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. So that's how we, we don't bring them out, we just count their respirations. We also have machines that measure the amount of oxygen that's uh, going into their bloodstream and also the amount of uh, carbon uh, dioxide that's coming out of the body. So we know that process is working and it's generating. So that's how we want it and then we just want to gradually bring them out. But we have that advantage because we have the training, we have the tools, and we can actually titrate it to what we need. You guys, you just have the white little uh, uh, thingy uh, nasal administrators, so you gotta do what you do, have to do to also bring them out, so. Okay. Questions? Thank you. Um, who then, okay, I'm gonna work up. Way in the back. Okay, so if you, in the one slide, you said something that it wears off in like 30 to 90 minutes, I believe. Uh, so when it wears off, how is that person going to be? Do they just go right back into not breathing? That, that is a possibility. They could become unresponsive again. And it all depends on how pure the drug is that they took. Uh, you know, the concentration of it, it was really powerful stuff, then it, it may, they may go unresponsive again and uh, naloxin or Narcan may have to be readministered. Mm -hmm. So that's why we always like okay. to transport them to the hospital so the hospital can monitor that. We, we never like to sign these patients off, you know, and leave them in the care and let them go and do whatever they want. So we'd like to take them and make sure somebody's watching over them after the administration of Narcan. Yeah, and depending on how much of the drug they took, they took or how much uh, the concentration is, uh, that whatever the opiate that they took could be metabolized in that 90 minutes. And then, um, so by the time the Narcan wears off, the opiate that they took has already been metabolized and they may just be conscious breathing and in a normal state, just depending on, on the drug itself. And going through withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. So if they're not breathing um, and you only have the nasal spray, can you still administer the nasal spray? Will it absorb through their mucous membranes or do you really need to get the paramex there right away? Excellent question. Yes, it will become absorbed, but you also might have to start performing chest compressions on that person. You know, hands only CPR, if you've heard of that, that's a big thing. It's up to you whether you wanna breathe for that person. Uh, but remember, they, they, they went unresponsive and the, the problem is because of a respiratory problem. So if it's a loved one and you trust them, I mean, I know people because they, they use heroin and needles, you know, putting your mouth even on that loved one, it might be a risk. So, you, you, and then start mouth to mouth too with those. And a lot of times, um, 
even when we're setting up on a scene, uh, if Kenny arrive, and I arrive on scene uh, for a, a known drug overdose, a heroin overdose, it, all the telltale signs are there. The lips are blue and cyanotic on our patient. Uh, while he's getting the IV ready, I may start bagging him with oxygen, mm -hmm. uh, bag valve mask, and they'll pink up and they'll actually start to come to a little bit and start fighting us a little bit. You know, I mean, they're not going to come totally out of it, but I can tell we're on the we're on the right path. We're not going down anymore. We're we're doing better already. And then when he gives a little bit of Narcan, that kind of brings the patient out even more, and I can stop. Uh, administering oxygen and breathing for that patient because they're starting to breathe on their own. So. Okay, thank you. We'll grab one more. You can handle that one. Okay. So I did some quick math and I counted 144 when you had those numbers up that were you administered. Uh, of those 144, I'm guessing some might have been repeat. Yes. Okay, so just assuming that that number is a little bit more than uh, whatever, what percent do you think would have died had they not been given Narcan? Uh, that is a good question. So. If we got called, I'm gonna say all of them. I mean, if, yeah. if we're called, I, I'm gonna say all of them. If we were called, there, there was a reason why we were called, and if we did not intervene, I'm gonna say all of them would have died. Well, it, yeah, they all would have died without intervention from somebody yes, else. So, or somebody else. Yeah, let's say in the, in these instances, let's say nobody found them. Uh, there's always the chance, a slight chance, that they could end up uh, where the the opioid that they took would wear off, the respiratory rate, the respiratory drive would would restart, and they could start breathing. Um, if somebody finds them and knows CPR. Uh, you know, maybe some chest compressions uh, would be enough to uh, bring them back. Uh, and I'll use like an example. So I was in uh, uh, Dublin. I was in Dublin, Ireland, and we were walking to breakfast. And there was a guy that I thought he was dead. He was laying, it was at, right by St. Odin's Church. So if you're aware, kind of downtown Dublin. And this guy looked, his, his hands were blue, and he looked like he was having trouble breathing. But then, so we went and checked him out, woke him up. Eyes were pinpoint, but then he started breathing again. So I'm like, okay. So we called 999, which is the way to summon ambulance over there. And uh, then he was bre he kept breathing the whole time. But that little bit of being disturbed might have been enough to reinstitute the respiratory drive on this guy. Now again. Maybe in 20 minutes or 30 minutes, if we'd have let him lay there, the respiratory drive would have been depressed again. Don't really know, but uh, as long as somebody, if something happens to make, uh, bring back that respiratory drive, so again, like let's say a few chest compressions. So you start doing chest compressions, somebody wakes up, and then that might be enough to uh, not, not need to call us, and there, that would be one of the groups that would be alive. One thing these numbers don't show is the number of people that died from a opiate overdose where they were beyond, when we showed up on scene, they were too far gone where we, any intervent, we didn't do any interventions because they were too far gone. So there, there was no way really to measure that. We arrive on scene and that they've already passed away four or five hours ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing nobody can do at that point. Right. So we didn't, those numbers are not included in here. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some that are there mm -hmm. where we show up on scene a few hours after the person's past. And some of these may be prophylactic as well. So like, let's say we're doing CPR and it may be another narcotic that they were prescribed. So, uh, and again, like, let's say the prescription overdoses, again, I go back to the, the cancer patients and there have been times in the past where I've been, we've worked a P, what we call a PNB, pulseless non-breather. And um, where we've given it prophylactically because they were prescribed an opiate. Um, we were not sure if they overdosed, but that's one of our, we call them the H's and T's. So um, overdose is one of those H's and T's uh, that we can check. And by giving the Narcan prophylactically, that might be enough, again, to reinstitute the respiratory drive once they get return of spontaneous circulation where, you know, they get blood flow and the heart starts again. Um, so, so these numbers, again, as far as I'm concerned, these numbers, 
in our area are not a lot to be alarmed about, but if we start seeing an increase in these numbers, then it's something to be alarmed about. Okay. Give us her. Oh, gave us a two minutes. Okay. Yes. So. Thank you guys, and thank you. thank you guys for your questions. <laughs> yes. So they did say they will stick around a little bit as well afterwards in case there's any additional questions. I'm going to invite down Amber Koplitz. She is a registered nurse. She is the manager of the emergency room at. Um, Aurora Medical Center, Washington County, over in Hartford. And I'll let her introduce herself a little bit more. But Amber's going to be talking about the um, emergency room response. So EMS has gotten there, transported them over to the hospital, and Amber's team takes over. OK. All right, hello everyone. So as um, Amy was talking, so definitely my name's Amber Koplitz. I am the nurse manager for the emergency department at Aurora, Washington County. Um, I'm gonna start out by saying nice save. High five, right? Like that's great job. Um, now what? So this is our response. The response definitely could be different, very based on what institution you would go into. Um, but this is pretty, it's a pretty um, standard process. So just a little bit about me. So why, why am I here? Why, why was I asked to be up here? I have over 20 years of experience in emergency medicine. So I started when I was 18 at St. Luke's in the emergency department. Um, as Jessica was talking, it was like reminding me of things. I wanted to be an AODA counselor. That's like, I came out of high school and that's what I wanted to do. And I got my like first big job um, working in the emergency department part-time at St. Luke's, um, just doing like health unit coordinator, answering the phone, that kind of stuff. Um, and I really started to see everything that the nurses were doing, the physicians were doing, et cetera, EMTs who are, who are our partners, our techs, and that's when I shifted in, into nursing. But you definitely still have that ability to be that teacher, that counselor, that partner in, um, in the emergency department. So I'm a community member. I live in Jackson, um, work in Hartford, but was born and raised um, just north of Hartford, technically Dodge County, but um, I don't say that too often. Um, <laughs> but, um, but definitely um, a community member here. I'm a parent. I'm a parent of three. Um, we actually are a licensed foster um, family, so we do have a foster child as well. So that was a big decision. We decided to take on a, a high school student, um, and that was something that a lot of my personal family had a lot of um, questions about of how are you going to handle the drugs, the alcohol, the sex, all that kind of stuff. So that's something that we really focused on, my husband and I, so. And then impacted by family members with substance abuse disorders. I have several family members and close friends that have um, been diagnosed with substance abuse or have had experiences. Many of them are in recovery and some aren't. Um, but that's just something that, you know, I think we, we all can, can connect about that. Um, I have no disclosures or anything. I'm just talking as a professional here and during my experience. So, so here comes our EMS call. <laughs> That's the extent of my high tech stuff, guys. So, okay, there you go. Um, I was real proud of myself. So, <laughs> um, we get our report from EMS. So, they're going to be telling us what's going on. They're the first look of everything. I give tons of credit to EMS. Um, I've done ride-alongs. I've done all that because I wanted to know what are you guys walking into, and sometimes it is scary. So, I like a more controlled environment in the emergency department. So definitely going to be hearing about what's going on. What did you guys find? What are you thinking? Did you give any medications? Sometimes Narcan is given. Was this a trauma situation? Was this a car accident? And then you guys gave Narcan too or, or whatnot. Um, so really, what is all going on? What other injuries? 
um, vital signs, anything like that, if you guys were able to get anything, that kind of thing, that's what we're gonna be hearing from the EMS call. Um, at that time, then we start to prepare our room. So we would be putting this patient into a room. We're gonna, based on the report from EMS, then get determine what supplies we're gonna need, any specialized equipment, anything like that. <clears throat> and then what other departments we need to alert. So respiratory therapy, do we need to call them because this is a respiratory arrest? Or the pulse ox just isn't the highest, we're in the low 90s, high 80s. Um, maybe we have like um, just a nasal trumpet or, an or like an oral airway or something else is going on, what else do we need? We're gonna call lab, um, if this is a trauma, then we're gonna need x-ray and CT and all of our diagnostic imaging partners. So it's just, we're gonna start to make those calls to sort of figure out what's going on. So if we are told that we did, um, Narcan was administered. So this is what I'm starting to think about. Yes, it was created in 1960, but in 1971, the FDA finally approved it for overdoses and that was to block the effects. And I think Kenny did a great job of that. So it's been used for decades in the emergency departments and with EMS. Um, so this is a long standing medication for this. It does induce withdrawal. So that's really like the side effect because it can, then you're gonna start to have the withdrawal symptoms related to that. Um, doses, the 0.4 milligram or one milligram. We went through how we can give it. These are our onsets. And then our onset is within one to three minutes depending on how um, it was administered. And then half-life, the 30 to 90. We can start an IV drip for extended use as well. So recently, I actually was just reviewing a trauma patient, was a car accident, um, was unhappy with his current home situation, and um, went and got some what he thought was heroin. It was actually pure fentanyl. Um, and he overdosed and he crashed into another vehicle. And luckily that other person wasn't injured, but he obviously was unresponsive. And um, the EMS actually gave, between EMS and the first responders who were the police officers, they gave eight doses of Narcan before they got to us. So then we gave two additional doses and then started the Narcan drip. So it was a lot and he was admitted to the ICU because he needed that for, because he had such a high amount of fentanyl in him. But like I said, he thought he was doing heroin. Okay, so patient care. So this is what's gonna happen. We're gonna check our ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, you know, that's the start of BLS. What are our oxygen needs? We'll go from there. We'll do a full assessment. Um, and like I said there, the trauma aspect, so what else is going on? What else happened to this patient? As simple as, um, we just two weeks ago had a patient, it was such a crazy story, but she overdosed at her home and she fell out of bed. She doesn't know when she fell out of bed and her dad found her when he got home from work. She thinks that she took something around 3 a.m. She wasn't sure, so now we're, you know, like 12 plus hours, and she was wedged between the bed and the um, nightstand. And her leg, it had cut off all the circulation to her leg. So now she has huge vascular injuries to her leg and will probably end up losing that leg because of it. So it's, we're trying to get that full assessment of what else is going on in that body. Um, so once we cover the ABCs, then we're moving on from there. We're checking out everything else, so. Establish an IV, if EMS hasn't gotten that yet, we're gonna collect our labs, we're gonna be checking electrolyte balances, cardiac monitoring, EKG, IV fluids, meds, if we need it, like Zofran. Remember I said we're gonna need water. Sorry guys. Um, that patient is probably going to be going through withdrawal, so we're going to be giving medications to help with that. X-ray and CTs, if we need them, urine collection for testing drug screens. Um, we, we standardly do a 10 panel regarding that, but fentanyl needs to be independently tested for. 
so fentanyl is synthetic, it does not show up on the opioid um, screen, on our drug screen. So we have to test independently for fentanyl. So that's something that our physicians are always aware of. And then if need be, a behavioral health evaluation. As West Bend was talking, all I was thinking was, so many times there's, there's a behavioral health undertone to all of this. So we definitely get those um, evaluations if we need to. Okay, so we did all this care, we did everything. Now we gotta decide what are we gonna do with this patient? Hours later, probably. Um, admission, so are we gonna admit him to the hospital? Like I said, that patient was on a Narcan drip, they're gonna be admitted. Transfer to the patient either for mental health services, so if this was a suicide attempt, they could be transferred, or to drug treatment. If they come in and they say, this is what I did, but now I want treatment, then we start down that path of where we could send that patient. Um, and suicide, so this has a lot to do with it. So if many times patients don't have the intent to overdose, but they do. Um, and then when you're talking with them and finding out a lot more about them, there is um, a undertone of suicide, that, that they don't wanna live anymore, they're depressed, all this stuff is going on, they're unable to cope with anything, so what else can we do there? Um, discharge, so sometimes patients do get discharged. They, there wasn't, you know, they took just a little bit too much, they were at a party, that kind of thing, and then they get discharged home. Some leave in police custody. If there's a warrant out for them, they're gonna go with the officers <laughs> once we clear them. And then I would say the majority of the time, unfortunately, these patients leave against medical advice. So patients have rights, and once they are awake and able to communicate effectively, and then they have the choice that they get to leave. Many times as um, EMS was talking, these patients do, when we take away their high, they wake up very unhappy, and they are leaving. There's nothing that we can do about it. So we try to reason with them, we try to explain, who can I call to make sure that you can get home safe, um, and if they don't want us to call anyone, then there's no one that we can call. So they do many times leave. Um, so complications after an overdose, like like we started to talk about the withdrawal after Narcan. So this could be um, nausea, vomiting, um, hallucinations, sweats, dizziness. It, I mean, could just go on and on of all the things that could happen. Is there a traumatic injury? So were they involved in something else? Did they fall down? Um, was it a car accident? Those kind of things the lack of oxygen to the organs. So this is where we can get our brain injuries, so um, an anoxic brain injury, if they did not receive oxygen to the brain for that period of time. The cardiac injury, many times if they're shooting up with IVs, then this could impact um, the heart as well, and they could get an infection around the heart or even in the heart. And then vascular injury, so if they are laying for 20 hours on that appendage, that extremity, that's gonna cut off all um, circulation and then they will have those vascular injuries as well. As well as if they're shooting up and it becomes infected, they can kill all that tissue around that area and then it creates a vascular injury. And then I really thought about this, that family and friend impact, that's a complication of overdose. That it's such a psychological impact um, you know, having a 12-year-old witness something as impactful as bringing his uncle essentially back to life, that leaves long psychological impacts. So just that, that constant um, reminder that it's not just the singular person that's impacted, but the extenuating people as well. So safety and care delivery. So. We really focus on staff, staff safety. Many times we actually get multiple overdoses almost back to back. If it's a party, 
they're all coming in. <laughs> and so now we have staff that need to manage all that. Um, we definitely utilize our security, public safety, whatnot, to um, assist with anything that we may need safety-wise. When they wake up and they are not happy, um, I tell my team, just back up and let's call in security to help to de-escalate the situation. Um, police, many times police are involved and they are there, they're a partner um, during these kind of things. Or if we need to, if the patient is starting to get really violent, we will call um, local police departments and they'll come flying in. <laughs> and then workplace violence education. So unfortunately, we have to start to think about this in really any, um, any career, but we really started to teach a lot about workplace violence and how to de-escalate these kind of situations because many times um, as healthcare workers, we are put in these situations where people are not happy. So how do we get ourselves through that? Um, and then patient belonging, so contraband or exposure to this. So um, if you are trying to get a patient undressed and there could be a sharps there, a needle, or even a vial that broke and that has a substance on it, now that, that nurse or tech or security or EMS, whoever's helping you, is now exposed to. So that's always um, something that's a factor that we're looking out for. So here are some um, overdose resources. So this is really what we're talking to with patients. We're really teaching them a lot. Like even with our discharges or admissions, you're constantly teaching. You're constantly talking. You're making connections. Sometimes those connections go nowhere, but they could, they could be fruitful. And if we're going to save one person, hey, it's worth it. I'll talk 100 times. So treatment facilities, we do have inpatient treatment facilities um, around the area. Like just off the top of my head, Rogers is one. Um, um, Aurora Psych, so down at the Dewey Center. I don't know if they take um, for, for overdoses like the, the detoxing. Um, but outpatient facilities, so th those are more where the patient can go there, um, but then still live at home or still attend a job, but still have their treatment. And then residential, so this is where pe patients can live. So for outpatient, there's Genesis or there's another one in Hartford um, that that patients can attend or residentials are like Elevate around the area, the Manor, um, Roots down in Milwaukee, Beacon House up in Fond du Lac for women. You know, those are definitely uh, residential areas that patients can go. And then for Washington County, we have like, our acute care services, so we definitely partner with them quite often. And then there was a, um, a program, and this is like more of a national thing too, it was located here um, in Washington County, was the Peer Support Specialist Program. So this was a great program where um, it was funded through the state um, by a grant where we had um, the ability to contact a recovered um, person and so that's a peer to them, and we can call them from the hospital and say, hey, we have a patient that's here that can you come in and talk with them and try to convince them to um, go either n go to rehab or, be, or stay clean or even just a peer support person um, to talk through stuff with, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then other community agencies and support are definitely out there. Um, Elevate is definitely one of them. Another one that um, I have heard people speak about is um, findrecovery.com. You can put in your zip code and it'll give you like all the meetings around the area and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's trying to leverage that technology to the best of our ability. So now that you're clean, now what, right? So patients um, disclose many times to healthcare teams that they are in recovery. They want to say, hey, I don't want that narcotic. I'm in recovery. And we're like, okay, sounds good. So what other um, meds can we give you for pain control? If you fo fell and broke your ankle, we got to do something. So we're going to try to figure out what else we can give you to, to keep you um, on your path 
in recovery. And then one thing that we do here quite often is when patients do disclose or they don't want to disclose, but we see it in the chart, is they really truly believe that we have an unconscious bias. And I'm not gonna say that it's not out there, right? Like everyone has an unconscious bias, but it's something that we are all working very hard on to not have, um, to make sure that we are treating the person. And I think you did a great story of, the, there's always a story behind that person and we gotta find that connection. We gotta figure out why. So really putting our biases to the side. And then long-term health impacts. So, <laughs> If they had vascular damage or something major happened, maybe they're now, their kidney shut down because of the overdose. Now they're on dialysis. This could lead to such long-term um, health impacts. So we got to focus on those. And then this was just a, a quote that I found that I thought was so great. So tomorrow is the most important thing in life. It comes to us at midnight very clean. It's perfect when it arrives, and it puts itself in our hands, and it hopes that we've learned something from yesterday. Because every day is brand new, and it literally just takes one day to get started. So that's what we try to really offer to um, our patients once they come in. Okay, thank you again, Amber. That was very, very good. I'm gonna have you hold tight a second in case we have any questions. Um, I'll come around with the microphone. If anybody is wondering as well about some of those resources that are in the area, um, Elevate is here tonight. We also, on the fourth night, are gonna have a little more from our um, community response and some community information. So not next week, the following week. And the Public Health Department is here as well too, so all of those have resources out there if you're looking for some more of those specifics. Um, so very, very good. It made a really nice picture um, for us. But does anybody have questions for Amber? Thank you. I did oh. such a great job. Yes. I just want to introduce myself. I'm Mike. Um, I'm one of the leaders that celebrate recovery uh, from Northbrook Church, and we deal with uh, addicts, codependents, um, alcoholics. I myself am a recovering alcoholic. I've been sober for 10 years. Um, I go to celebrate recovery every week. It's free. So if you know someone uh, who struggles with addiction or anything else, have them come to Northbrook Church on Tuesday night. It starts at 6.30. Thank you. All right, thank you. And thank you again, Amber. We'll give Amber a round of applause. We appreciate you coming. We do have a post quiz. Um, Ashley, do you need to say anything else about it? It's the same three questions. Okay. Um, but tonight again was really all about overdose and some of the options and things that are out there for overdose and why um, it is important to um, consider what EMS is able to do, what some of those home Narcan kits are available for and why they're important as well in the community. Um, next week, week three, hopefully the weather will be a little bit better. Um, we're gonna talk about the power of those substance use disorders. Um, again, we wanna have a little bit of hope every night, so I think our first speaker tonight did a really nice job of talking about some of the hope that's out there around some of these um, tough issues. Amber also ended us with a nice quote and we heard some good stories from EMS as well. So we'll continue that next week. And then week four will be our response. Um, responses and solutions, and this is a little bit more community-wide, Washington County-based, um, some of the things that are in place and going on here as well. So if you didn't already start or do that post quiz, it's just those same short three questions. I'll have you take a look and do that. And then we have some um, people that were around, resources out in the back. Um, the Hidden in Plain Sight Room is still 
there for a little bit as well too. If you didn't get a chance to look at that last week, um, if you want to peek at it tonight or it will be here every week of the series as well too, it's just a nice visual of what you may see in somebody's room that you suspect um, might have a substance use disorder and just some of them are a little more obvious than others so it's kind of a neat eye opener. And once you're done, you can feel free to get up and go. And we really appreciate all of you coming, especially with the weather. And we appreciate all of our speakers. So thank you again.